Hello to all of you. We're going to get started here now. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar tomorrow from the beginning. I'm Janet Nelson from DEMCO and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping details and then I will introduce our speaker and she'll start her presentation. On your screen right now, you should see a chat box in the lower right hand corner. And if you have a question or having any type of technical issues, please feel free to type something in there and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. We will pause at a couple points during the presentation and at the end of the session for questions. If something comes up during the session that you would like clarification on or you want to respond to, I'll be compiling those thoughts and questions as they come in and we can address them at the breaks. If we don't get to your question during the session, we will be continuing to compile those questions that come in and we'll be sure to get those answered and posted with the recorded webcast after the event. There is also specific contact information available for Kathy or myself that you should see right now on your screen. So you can feel free to email us separately um, if you have a specific question that we may be able to help you with. But we ask that you do that after this. Well, you can do it during the session, but we just won't be checking our emails during the session. So we won't be able to get back to you until then. We will be using Twitter as well um, during today's session. And the hashtag that we're using is hashtag Demco time. You should be able to see that on the slide on your screen and it's also typed into your chat box on that right hand corner. Uh, that feed will be monitored today for um, questions and comments and so we'll be able to feed those in as they come in. I believe that's all I have on the, the housekeeping items so now I'm going to move on to introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Janet Nelson, the Director of Industry Relations from DEMCO and I'm the moderator today. Um, DEMCO is very pleased to sponsor these sessions and I'm happy to see how many of you are signing on to hear about this topic that's so relevant to all of us. I'm pleased to introduce you to Kathy Hakala Ospirk, who will be our speaker today. Kathy is a library administrator, advocate, speaker, and trainer who believes the future of our libraries depends on our attitudes towards innovative service. She is currently the executive director of the Northeast Ohio Regional Library System and a 28-year public library veteran. She also serves as adjunct faculty member at Kent State University School of Library and Information Science and is the pr principal consultant for Libraries Thrive Consulting. As a frequent speaker at national and state conferences, staff days, and workshops, she has a passion for supporting, coaching, and developing successful libraries, staff members, and leaders. She has been a contributor and guest editor for ALA's Allied Professional Association's Library Work Life, and her book, Be a Great Boss, One Year to Success, was published in January 2011 by ALA Editions, and her newest book, Build a Great Team, will be available through ALA Editions early next year. So Kathy, we are going to go ahead and put the controls into your capable hands, and you can get started when you are ready. Well, thank you very much, Janet. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be here today. And I'd like to welcome everybody who's taken the time to attend this webinar. I can tell you that it was a long, long time ago when I attended a time management webinar. And since then, I think I've recommended it to a 1,000 people or more. I hope you will feel that this is worth your investment of time. But I think sometimes we just have to step back a little bit, as busy as we've gotten, and look at better ways to do the things we're doing. As Janet said, if you have questions or comments or ideas or thoughts, anything you want to share, we learn a lot from each other in these webinars as well. So please feel free as I'm talking to go ahead and text those to her and we'll try to get to them at um, about the center of the presentation. I love being able to teach people and talk to people across the country, but I, I do miss that opportunity to be face to face and interact. So I love to encourage people to use that chat box. Okay, as I said, I attended my first time management workshop a long, long time ago, and I'll never forget a quote um, that was included with that that kind of has been something I've referred to in all of the, um, the uh, subsequent times I've talked about time management. Don't say you don't have enough time. You have exactly the same number of hours per day that were given to Helen Keller, Louis Pasteur, Michelangelo, Mother Teresa, Leonardo da Vinci, Thomas Jefferson, and Albert Einstein. And that's from H. Jackson Brown. 
And whenever I read that or share it with a new group of people, I'm truly struck by how often I can allow myself to get so busy and so caught up in my my day-to-day -day, um, sort of out-of-control work life that I forget what some people like that have been able to accomplish and their 24-hour days are exactly the same as mine. So I think that's kind of inspiring in a way because one of the worst things about being out of time is that sense of hopelessness. Believe me, I have um, had an opportunity to talk to people in all corners of the, the country recently and I'll tell you what the most common complaint that I hear all the time is I just don't have time. People are panicked, they're frustrated, budgets have been cut, positions have been um, left empty and not filled. Two, three people used to do the work of now what one person is doing and there's an awful lot of panic in the air, understandably, because what happens as this process goes along is that more and more we expect one another to be urgent, to we're behind, we start, we come in in the morning and we're already pulling our hair out because we're letting time get the better of us. But what we have to do now is we have to take over and manage our own time and get our lives back. I don't know about you, but this looks pretty familiar to me. Uh, you know the old expression, um, your poor planning is not my emergency. It's easy to say that, but these days it's not so easy to apply because everybody, it seems like, is, is just all over the place, behind and frantic and rushing around. And that leads to a lot of cultural problems in organizations. When you've got a group of people who are um, stressed, anxious, worried, nervous about all these different deadlines they're going to meet and, and feeling inadequate in meeting them, You've got a staffing problem, you've got a morale problem, and as time goes on, you've got um, a problem with the culture of your organization. But individually and as leaders and bosses, we can get a handle on this, and I can assure you that you can get around these kinds of problems and panic and turn your library, your organization, back into a place where people enjoy coming to work every day and feel that sense of achievement of getting their work done not just slogging through the pile one day after another. One of the things Janet shared with me as we were getting ready for this webinar is that some of you sent in questions as you were registering. And I'm going to try my best to address a couple of those that I've seen. And the first one is, where do you start? When you're going to be managing your time, taking back your life, where do you start? And I think that is an excellent question. My answer is that you start with your paycheck. We have to remember, we have to refocus, we have to reaffirm why we come to work every day. And the reason we come to work is to meet the goals of our organization. So it's always a time when you're starting to reorganize yourself to think about why, what is the organization expecting of me? You know, just as libraries kind of caught, caught up over the years um, and started telling communities what they should read instead of asking them, Sometimes staff members can get the same way. We can get so caught up doing the things we like to do, the things that we've quote unquote always done this way, that we can lose sight of what are the goals of our organization. What does our boss want us to do? Now in a very healthy organization, this is all going to start with a strategic plan. Um, one of the things that, that um, I do strategic planning consulting, I always talk about how the board needs to be the entity that sets the goals and then the management or the planning team needs to establish the objectives, but it's the individual staff members, one at a time, who look at those goals and objectives and say, here's exactly what I'm going to do, here's my contribution to this organization, and when you're managing your time, that's where you should be starting. If you don't have something as formal as a strategic plan to use, then I would suggest this is a perfect time to sit down with your boss. I just heard a really good piece of advice recently where we should take out a piece of paper, not now, but um, after this webinar, and write down all the things you do, all the tasks that you do, as many as you can possibly think of, and then ask permission to have a meeting with your supervisor and sit down and go over with her or him what you do with your day, what, how you spend your time. Because the interesting thing is going to be 
there might be things missing that they think you should be doing or they wish you were doing that aren't on the list, so you can add them. There might be things on that list that they're going to say, I didn't know you still did that. I don't, I don't want you spending your time doing that, and you can take those off. It's really a great way to get that initial focus before you decide you're going to start on this new sort of campaign of managing your time. Make sure you've got the right goals and the right plan in place. I'm going to talk about a few tools for time management, just a few of them that I think are absolutely critical and you can't do without. And hopefully as a result of that focused, goal-oriented plan and the tools that you need in hand, you're going to be ready to manage your time effectively. And the second part of the webinar, I'm going to talk a little bit about what your average day should look like. Okay, we have to get back again to some of the questions that were asked when you were registering for this workshop. And one of the really good ones is, how do you prioritize? I would say again, you need to go back to that, that list of goals or the clarity of goals between you and your supervisor. But then you need to do the second best thing, which is to create your own performance plan. If you're lucky, you and your supervisor can create a performance plan together that will become a reflection resulting in perhaps a good evaluation or maybe even a merit increase. But even if you don't have a supervisor who's um, involved in performance planning, you should sit down with your understanding of the strategy of your organization, you have an understanding of what's expected of you with your supervisor, and so you create a performance plan of your own. The best thing to do is to keep it um, limited to a period of time, say a year, perhaps go back and revisit it every quarter, but basically what you're doing is you're prioritizing your work. Of all the things you need to do, what do you need to get done this month? What needs to be done absolutely before December 31st? What needs to be done before a new fiscal year starts in July? Look at those time periods. Pick the time periods that work for you, the ones that match your workplace and your, your professional life. And of all of those lists of goals that you established, prioritize them in order that they're to be accomplished. Because that's going to help you, again, as you're breaking up your time and dividing your time into effective processes, it's going to help you make sure you're not drifting off. Because don't we all do that? I don't know about you, but if I've got 10 things to do and eight of them I don't like, I'm going to start kind of doodling and practicing and working and drafting that number nine thing that I think is kind of fun to do, even though it's not due till August of 2013. That's one time waster that we can get rid of just by starting with this overarching strategy that I'm suggesting. So you look at your organization's goals and objectives. You review what your role is, what you play, the role you play in reaching those. You review that with your supervisors so that you're being um, um, supported um, and, and made sure you're making sure that everything that you're doing is what your supervisor is expecting you to do. And then you take those goals, that list, and you put them in priority order. Again, not only should you play to the strengths of your own skills and your own abilities and your own dreams and your own hopes for professional growth, but it's going to help you both to grow as an individual and to meet those expectations of your supervisor, which is of course what we're all here for. You know, you've probably heard that of the dozens and dozens of times the literature has reflected surveys that are done of people in the workplace and asking what is the most important thing to you. Time and time again, what comes back is the ability to make a significant contribution. In other words, to be successful. That's what people want to do. And by prioritizing their time and their energies, they're going to be much, much more um, attuned to it and much more able to do it. So I promised I would tell you about some tools. I'm going to tell you about four things that I think are absolutely critical for someone who manages their time well. And here's the first one. Your very best friend in the whole world should be your calendar. Now, I know I'm a baby boomer, and I'm not the kind of, I have an iPad, and I know how to play Jeopardy and look at my granddaughter's pictures on it. I don't know a whole lot more yet, but I'm working on it. I have a smartphone, so I'm not a completely, uh, you know, old-fashioned person. 
but um, some people like to have those calendars in paper. Some people like to carry around a, you know, a day timer kind of a log. Other people use an online calendar system. I happen to use the Microsoft Outlook system. Other people might use a calendar on their iPhone, um, a Siri calendar. I don't have an iPhone 5, but Siri looks like it would be a lot of fun to play with. Doesn't matter. Wherever you are in the technology timeline, whether you're from the Stone Age or you're cutting edge, uh, you know, youngest generation, you have to have a calendar and you have to use your calendar or I'm afraid managing your time effectively is going to be something, a goal that's going to be always outside of your reach. So what do you do with the calendar? First of all, you write on it. Secondly, you read it so you can see what you wrote on it. And thirdly, you pay attention to it. I just walked past my kitchen calendar the other day, which I don't pay half as much attention to as I do my online calendar at work, which has my entire life on it. And I said to my husband, uh-oh, your niece's birthday was three days ago. And he says, how come when we forget her birthday, she's my niece? But that's exactly what had happened. I had written down it was her birthday, but I, I didn't do, I made the cardinal sin of not writing down the week before, get birthday card. That's the most important thing about your calendar. That's what's going to help you be able to know when to say yes and when to say no to a new project judging how much time you really have to devote to it. That's what's going to help you have a breather so that you can schedule in time to do something personal, something with your family. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what's going to help you have enough time to truly be able to know that when an emergency comes up, as of course they always do, that's okay. You've got a couple openings on your calendar. You can move some things over and still meet deadlines. And what I'm talking about is putting a due date on the calendar, but then backing up and putting all of the things that contribute to that due date on the calendar as well, blocking off time. For example, when Janet first contacted me and asked me if I could do a Demco webinar on time management, I was very happy to do so. She said she wanted it in early October. So first I looked at my early October calendar and I had this day free. And then I thought to myself, okay, how much time am I going to have to spend preparing for this webinar? And I figured how many hours or how many different um, segments I'd want to do my outline, I'd want to create my PowerPoint, I'd want to do my run through. And I went backwards from this date in October to the week before, the week before that, the week before that. And where I found openings, I scheduled blocks of time that said work on Demco webinar. That's one of the most important things that people forget to do when they use a calendar. All of your time is important. And I'll, and I'll tell you something. I'll tell you about how well this works. Um, I, as Janet said, I have a full-time job. I'm executive director of the Northeast Ohio Regional Library System, full-time position. I also teach for Kent State University. I teach management. I teach a class for the Public Library Association. I do webinars like this. I've written two books. I've been married 33 years, I have three children and a grandchild and a half. All of these things happen and are able to happen, not because I am a dysfunctional overachiever, as some people may have thought, but because I try very, very hard to manage my time. And in addition to all the professional work that matters to me that I fit in, the most important thing is that I still have time for my family because I make sure to keep that time free as well. There's nothing that can be more, more stressful or more depressing than to run into somebody who says, oh, I haven't been able to see one Little League game this summer. All I do is work. And I just want to take that person aside and say, let's sit down with your calendar and let me help you organize your time. Because we can't do that. We have to keep that, that important work-life balance. So your, your number one friend, your most important tool is your calendar and how you use it. Your second most important tool are files. And again, you can go old-fashioned and buy the manila files at Office Max. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those librarian types, you know, spices in alphabetical order. I would much rather spend an afternoon. And I, I, This is a, an example of heaven in my marriage is that we go to this one plaza where my husband wanders around in Home Depot and I wander around in Office Max for an hour and we're both absolutely in heaven. 
that's just me. You know who you are out there. These files are so important, keeping your information organized. Whether you use paper files and a, and a sliding drawer, or whether you're using online files that you're accessing through you know, a chip in your molar or your iPad or whatever you want to do, keeping information organized is going to save you a ton of time. You know those, those pictures of people whose desks are a mess? Uh, well, we're going to get to that in a, in a couple minutes. Those are the people who don't take the time to organize this information. And look at the irony in that. You know, what are we? We're librarians. Our whole job is taking information and organizing it, categorizing and classifying in a way that makes it easily accessible. And yet professionally, if you look in some of our offices, you'd be shocked to see how bad you are at that. But let me give you an example of why this is so important. When I first started in the job I'm in now, there's a shared file here in our computer system where everything important was kept. So uh, the first time I was going to do evaluations for the staff, I thought, OK, let me, let me file these where the evaluations go. And it took me an hour to go through all of the different files on the system before I figured out that the old evaluations were under a folder called administration under another folder called personnel, under another folder called drafts, under another folder called personnel, and then I found the folder called evaluation. Now, I'm not being critical of that because you know what, that probably worked for the person I replaced, the person who set it up. But that's just the point. These files and folders and the way we categorize our information to manage our time has to work for us. So often we step into a job, we fall into that quote unquote, we've always done it this way format. We adopt whatever the office or the reference desk looks like when we start there. <coughs> and we don't get a chance to have it make sense to us where we can save time. Now, if you go to our shared drive and you open it up, guess what? Front page, front and center, there's a new folder I made called evaluations. And that's the way it worked for me. But we absolutely have to structure information, especially if we're in positions of supervision or management where we've got people, the responsibility of people, um, their careers, their um, growth and development, maybe their discipline. We absolutely have to be sure to structure, protect, and organize the, all the information that we're expected to manage because we've got to keep it where it can truly be useful to us in a quick and easy way. You've also got to make sure, just like with the calendar, it's no good if you don't write on it, and then if you don't read what you wrote on it, these folders and files aren't any good unless you use them. So when we're going through email, when we're going through the inbox full of stuff, we're not just moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. We're actually taking these pieces of information and we're filing them where they go. If I open an email that is something I need to work on next week, I don't leave it in my inbox. I've created a set of folders. Again, I use uh, Microsoft Outlook. I've created a whole set of folders. Um, so I might have a folder called Staff Day. And I'll take that email and I'll drag it over to that folder. Now we're going to talk in a minute about my to-do list. On my to-do list or on my calendar, I'll put Work on Staff Day on the appropriate day. When I get to that calendar day and I see what I'm supposed to be working on, I know right where I'm going to find the information I need in my staff day folder. I don't have to open my email and find, you know, sift through 300 um, inbox entries. I know exactly where I put that. At the end of my day, my email inbox is empty. And everything is where it's supposed to be for when I need it. So that's your second tool. Your first one was your calendar, and your second one is this system of filing information. Your third tool is something that's also very, very critical, and that is your log. Now, I have a picture here of a clipboard only because that's what I started with. Um, the, the thing that got me using the log was back when I worked in a, a large regional library where there were about probably eight librarians who shared what we called PIC duties. PIC stood for person in charge. So I could come in at from 1 to 9, and I was going to be the PIC. 
I needed to stop at the reception desk and pick up the clipboard that was our log and see what had happened since I had been there last. Maybe I'd been there the previous day till 9 o'clock and I'd only missed four hours. Maybe I'd had a day off or a weekend off. But I needed to know if the, if the plumber was coming back in, if there was a leak in the roof, if we were having problems locking the door, if there was you know, a class of 30 people coming in. Whatever information was important to, to all of us, we needed to share it and we needed to make sure we kept track of it. So that started me on the habit of using a log and I have never stopped. What I have done is because legal pages or legal um, tablets, you can only flip those pages over so many times they start falling off. Other pieces of loose paper, post-it notes, etc. end up losing their way. So a long time ago I went to a spiral notebook and I keep them kind of like you keep a checkbook register, you know, start day, stop day. And what has happened is these really useful, um, what started as to-do lists, have turned out for me to become almost a diary. I keep, um, what I start a page every day. I actually put those little squares that you see on the slide to the left of each line when, when what, what I'm writing is something that I have to do. Sometimes I'm just making a note or copying down a phone number or something, or I think, wait a minute, I called that person two weeks ago, I had their number down, I just flip right back through that um, spiral notebook to what day I'm thinking of and there's the person's phone number. Now how much time did that save? But when I am writing down something that needs to be done, I put one of these little boxes next to it. When I do it, I check it off. If I look at that page and see three boxes with nothing checked off, I know I've got a few more things I've got to do. I don't know about you. I've got three grown kids and as I said, one and a half grandkids. If I didn't write this stuff down, there would be absolutely no hope that I would ever remember the things I have to do. When we're organized like this, not only are we getting more accomplished with our time, but we're also very importantly modeling to everyone who works around us and specifically to everyone who works under us what it is to be organized, what it is to be responsible enough to realize that my time is valuable, your time is valuable. If I tell you that I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it because I'm going to make a note to myself that it gets done. Just like a, a pebble in a pond, when we work together as teams and one or another of the members of the team don't manage their work and manage their time effectively, you know as well as I do that it eventually has that domino effect of, of impacting every single person on the team. So this keeps a record, it helps you keep track of what you're doing, it helps you manage your time and look at what still needs to be done, and overall it just basically puts you back in charge of your own life. So your three tools so far, calendars, folders of some kind, and a log or a record of your work, a to-do list of some kind. But most importantly, when you come to um, wanting to truly manage your time and to become more effective, the fourth tool that you need is your attitude. One of the things that always comes up when training new in-charge people is kind of that concept of whatever you do, don't become one of these people who closes the car door in the morning and walks towards the building thinking, I know I'm in charge today, but I sure hope nothing goes wrong because I have to have that budget done by 2 o'clock. I've put it off and now it's due. And I hope nobody calls in sick and there's no problems for me to deal with. And, and you can hear yourself as you're getting closer to the building, getting more and more worried, more and more stressed, more and more anticipating the worst. And the first person who says good morning to you, you bite their head off because you're already a wreck. This is not a good approach to time or work management. On the other hand, if you have the attitude walking towards that building from your car, thinking, well, I'm in charge today, you know, there's always something that goes wrong, but it's okay, I can handle it because that budget's due at 2 o'clock, but I've worked on it every day, I've only got about an hour's left to do. The first person who says good morning to you with that attitude is going to hear, good morning, how are you today? Time management is worth, in my mind, a lot more than just getting stuff done. It's, it's a piece of the contribution 
to the entire culture of our organization, to people's attitude, to people's um, reaction to coworkers, to people's management of stress. It's more than just getting tasks accomplished if it's, if it's approached in the right way. And I think the attitude that we take towards it, that we're going to get a handle on it, we're going to work on it, we're going to manage it in such a way that there's time. You know, I, I spend a lot of time training um, in management and supervision. And the first thing I tell people who are new bosses is whatever you do, don't get caught up in this stuff. Don't, don't let me talk to you six months from now and have you tell me that you spend hours every week creating a schedule. Because once you're a boss, even though those tasks become your responsibility, and I know there's still work to do, all of a sudden you've been given the privilege of one of the most important roles that any of us can take, and that is coaching and growing and developing and motivating other human beings. That's what you're going to need your time for. So you better be pretty good at managing your time around the tasks that need to be done so you can save yourself for those really, really important parts of your job. So like I said, what I'd like to do in a couple minutes is kind of take you through what an average day is going to look like for somebody who has decided that they're going to take control of their time, they're going to organize it, they're going to use these tools, and they're going to move forward and get as much accomplished in a rewarding and relaxed way as they possibly can. But before we go ahead and start on that average day, I do want to pause for just a minute and see, Janet, has anybody issued any questions or comments that we can talk about? Yes, Catherine, we do have some questions um, from the audience. And I know we're going to be running a little bit tight on time. So I'm just going to, at this time, ask one question. And then if we have time at the end, we'll come back and answer some, ask some of the others. Okay. So the question that I'm going to pose is, how do you manage if you don't get the tasks that you've written down for the day done? Um, this person just indicated that it seems to her like she spends a lot of time carrying things over to the next day. Well, that's a really good question. That's one of the reasons I love Outlook, because you know you can just drag them over and drop them. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but you can. But again, I think that goes to prioritization. One of the things I'm going to talk about now as we go through the next day is the very last thing you do before you leave for the day is you get that log ready for the next day. And what I do is looking again at my priorities and at my goals and thinking about where I am in the organization, when I turn the page before I leave here this afternoon, I'm going to look at the things that I haven't checked off and I'm going to move them over to tomorrow in priority order. And if there's something that's really important, I'm going to actually probably put a star or something by it. Those are the things I'm going to, I'm going to start on in the morning when I come in. Those are the things that I didn't get done that have to be done. Now, I'll say one more thing, though, is that if you are using this calendar and you're thinking about breaking this work up into manageable pieces, you're probably going to find that that's going to happen less and less frequently. Because whereas before, if you have a quarterly report to write that takes you four hours and you're working on it the day before it's due, you might be running into, you know, oh, I didn't get this done because three people called in sick and I had to cover the desk. That's much more likely to happen. But if you have that quarterly report broken into maybe 40 minutes of work three days last week and a couple days this week, small bites of the work, then it's much less likely that you're going to be stuck with that. It's due tomorrow and it's not due. So I guess that would be my, my two-part answer to that. OK, I think we should probably move on at this time. And like I said, we'll come back to other questions towards the end if we have time. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll try to save five minutes. If I don't, fe please feel free to remind me that I should stop. <laughs> okay, managing time when you're doing a presentation is always a challenge, too, because you always want to spend as much time talking to people as you can, and you don't get through everything. So, all right, we're going to start the day. This is a, a sample of how people can be using their time for the best. This isn't going to be for everybody. Some of you out there are going to be thinking, well, morning isn't my best part of the day. I'm best at the end of the day. And so I would invite you to just kind of apply what I'm saying to how it works for you personally. But going forward, uh, studies show that for most of us, 
the be very beginning of the day is our strongest time. That's when we are really productive, we're fresh, we've had a couple cups of coffee, we're energized, we've forgotten the, the gripes and the groans and the uh, little problems of the day before that might have kind of gotten us down and we're ready to start again. So the important thing is to remember that that's a great part of your day to get right to work and to get the most um, kind of high energy work done. Here's the picture I was telling you about before, coming up. You're going to come in in the morning with all that energy, and the first thing you're going to do is want to sit down and review what's on your plate. Like I said, when I come in, my desk is clear. I have my log sitting next to it. It's turned to the next page, and I've got two or three things listed that I've moved over that I know I start my day with. This woman, not so much. I don't know what she does. I don't know how she could get started. I don't know how she could ever get anything accomplished. And I would say that even though I've had a lot of bosses whose offices look like this, they've all told me at one time or another, oh, this place may be a mess, but I know where everything is. And to that, to them, I would say, baloney. You do not. You're going to waste your time. You're going to waste my time. You're going to lose things that I'm going to have to duplicate, and we're all going to waste time. So the best thing to do to use that high energy you're bringing in in the morning is come in to a clean desk. Okay, you're going to look at your calendar. You've got things set up on that calendar that you're going to be working on. You may have meetings. You may have certain um, special times set aside that we'll talk about in a minute. But you're going to be looking at your calendar, and it was prepped when you left yesterday, so you're not going to be wasting any time wondering what should I start on. Meanwhile, that energy and that enthusiasm and that coffee <laughs> is starting to waste away. You've got to make sure you jump right in and you get going. Remember that you're checking in with people. I mean, I used to, there, I had one boss who would walk past me every morning and never even say good morning. I mean, this was someone who was really focused on getting busy with her day. And I don't suggest that, of course, but on the other hand, there are people who have a tendency to stretch that cup of coffee and talking about the family out a little bit too long in the morning. And it's a shame because they really are wasting that strong part of the day when they should be getting busy. There is a better time to do the social um, kind of connection thing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the morning isn't it. Morning is a time to get in there and absolutely get going and get started on your day. Remember, though, when you're creating these um, calendar entries, and especially when you're creating your to-do list on your log, um, don't be, this is pie in the sky. I, you know, sometimes these PowerPoint images are a bit of a stretch, so I apologize for this one. Be realistic. Um, I, I worked at a library where we had a manager's meeting every month. The, um, the rule of the day was that we were trying to save everyone's time back during our really bad budget cut days. So all meetings were cut down to one hour. But the agendas kept coming out with four hours worth of stuff to talk about. That's not going to do you any good if you're using all of these tools and yet you're giving yourself a to-do list that, you know, as, as my husband would say, his to-do list far exceeds his life expectancy. You want to make sure that those lists are very, very um, realistic, things you can accomplish, you're going to want to go home feeling good about yourself. You're going to want to go home thinking, man, I can't believe I got that quarterly report done. Good, now I can work on something that I like a little bit better starting tomorrow. So what are you going to do? You're going to start in the morning doing that big stuff, doing those things like the, the reports that are kind of lengthy, the, uh, the big assignments, I would say and you're going to portion them out. The best way to approach any kind of a major job, as I'm sure you've, you've heard, is in baby steps or you know, small bites. So you're going to say, I, I do actually have a quarterly report due next week, and I have portioned out, figuring it's going to take me about three hours to write it. I picked three days, and I put down work on quarterly report one hour, and I stop. One of the reasons I stop is because I've probably got some other stuff on my calendar to do. But another reason I stop is because after an hour I'm getting bored and I'm not doing a good job anymore and I'm not high energy. So I break it up into pieces so that I can work on it a little bit at a time and really get it done with 
some efficiency and some enthusiasm and not just kind of grind it out, you know, like it's Thanksgiving dishes or something that you absolutely have to get through. Mornings are good for projects. Mornings are good for getting a lot of work done and really, you know, nose to the grindstone kind of stuff. Even when I worked in a public library, when mornings were a little bit slow um, from a patron or reference perspective, that was when I knew I could really get into some of my other programming or collection development or my other things I was doing. So projects come in the morning. Midday, whenever your midday is, stretch, take a break walk around, get a glass of water, take care of yourself. One of the most important lessons to come out of management of time and accomplishment of our day is that we have to take better care of ourselves. We can't sit there looking at the computer all day. We can't stand on our feet behind a reference desk all day. We've got to make sure that we're giving ourselves these breaks, physical and mental, that are going to find a way to uh, keep us healthy. A lot of libraries are going to a lot of these great health programs now where, you know, you put on a pedometer and you walk around the first floor, second floor, first floor, second floor, three, four, five, six times, and that's a mile. And there's all kinds of ideas that you can apply to, to get yourself and maybe your, your coworkers um, kind of energized about this. But whatever you choose, find some way to give yourself a break halfway through your day and take care of yourself. Now the second half of your day is when it's time to add people. All of that, um, that high energy focus for projects and writing and, and doing those major things for the morning has kind of passed. You've had lunch. You've had a bit of a stretch. It's time now. This is a really good time to work together as a team. This is a picture of my daughter in high school and her dance troupe. And I told her the other day I used this in a national webinar and she just about fainted. So the only um, agreement we came to was I'm not allowed to tell, her, tell you which one's her. Anyway, these kids work together great, and you want to work together great too with everybody on your team. Afternoon is a good time to, you know, if you're going to sit somebody down and have a meeting, if you've got committee work that you're going to do. Um, Samantha Hines wrote a book, H-I-N-E-S. She wrote a book on librarians and time management that's excellent. One of the suggestions she makes in her book is if you're in a leadership or management um, situation, have office hours in the afternoon. Instead of having, you know, I have an open door policy, which everybody says and all that means is you're interrupted all day long no matter what you're working on, have some office hours at a time of the day like in the afternoon when you're very well suited to working and talking and relaxing with other people because your report is almost done, etc. That's a time to get involved in any kinds of activities that involve others. And that's a good time, too, for management by walking around, which is that last section on the slide. Last but not least, you're almost at the end of your day. Now you're going to check your email. And I know that this can be a really startling thing to say, but I would suggest you turn off that annoying little that we get when we get an email. If you have an emergency, if somebody really, really needs you, they're going to get you. I'm reminded of the time my husband and I went on our very first vacation alone to Canada, and we left two teenage sons at home threatened to the nines that they had to behave, and just in case I took my cell phone. And my husband kept asking me, are you going to call home? Are you going to call home? And finally I said, are you nuts? Why am I going to call home? I don't want to hear that they're fighting. I don't want to hear that they're out of food. Believe me, if there's an emergency, they're going to call us. The same with email. When you think about email, if you happen to be sitting next to or standing or working next to a window, and in your town, the mailman decided instead of coming once a day, he was going to drive around your parking lot and stop at your mailbox every five minutes, would you run outside every five minutes to see what he brought? We have become slaves to this email. We have given so much time over to it. And my recommendation to you is don't do it. People will come to know, oh, she checks her email at 4 o'clock, or if you work evenings, she always checks her email at 7.30. I'll hear back from her. Be consistent in the dependability with which you respond to email, but save it for the end of the day. And then act on it. Read it. File it. Move it delete it, 
make sure that when you leave at the end of the day that inbox is empty or almost empty, maybe leaving only the few things that you've got on the top of your priority list for the next morning. It's really important for you to, to get out from under the monkey that we have on our back that is email and save it for that very specific time of the day just before you leave. And just before you leave, again, remember, you're preparing your workstation for successful time use the next morning. So leave it, turn around and look at it as you're walking out and leave it the way you want to see it in the morning so you can come in and you can get the most done right away. One more thing I have to say, probably just because of might be a great boss, but I, I absolutely have to say this. As you're planning your time and you're working with your calendar and you're scheduling things in pieces that will allow you to manage time better, don't forget to schedule time for yourself. One of the, um, the dean of the library school was the management teacher I had back in 1987. And one of the first things she said to us was, anybody who can't find one hour a week to just sit and think or read or grow or somehow develop their skills is in bigger trouble than anything else we can do for them. So you're going to be working with that calendar. You're going to be scheduling things that have to be done. Don't forget yourself. Time to read a journal. I know you, know, you, read, you hear managers all the time now saying, oh, I haven't read a journal in six months. I don't have time. That's kind of scary to me. Because people in leadership positions are the ones we trust to lead us forward. And if they can't find the time to carve out of their day to read and become aware of what the important changes are coming down the road, I think that's kind of frightening. So my suggestion to you is that you take that one hour a week and you dedicate it to your professional development plan. Um, maybe when you look through your goals and your priorities and you created your plan, maybe you realized that part of it you weren't so really ready to do yet. That happened to me when I became a deputy director several years ago and I was told, you're in charge of strategic planning. I didn't really know a lot about strategic planning. So the first thing I did with my time was I put myself in kind of a strategic planning training course. I found some articles that I spent that time reading. I signed up for a class online that I used that time for, and I developed a skill that was really important to the job I had right then with my time. Don't forget how important this is. It's your career. It's going to go by in a flash as it is anyway, but we have to make time for ourselves so that we're always at our best. I probably don't have to tell you the value of time management, but I will anyway because I have this slide. <clears throat> with this great graphic of the domino effect. Putting, putting your time in your hands and your control is going to make you a stronger and a more productive individual. It's going to be a wonderful way for you to serve as a role model to other people in your library. Hopefully your, your successes will be catching and before you know it, the whole productivity level of your entire organization is going to go up. It's going to help you save money because you're going to find ways to be more efficient and to be more effective. And it's going to allow you to have the flexibility that you need to truly find a healthy work-life balance. You know, work-life balance is one of those cliches that's been thrown around a lot, like thinking outside the box, you know, that kind of a thing. But it's real and it matters. And although our organizations and our bosses would love to take credit for making sure we have work-life balance, the fact of the matter is it's each of our own personal responsibilities to find and keep it. And one of the ways that I'm sure to do that is to manage my time as best I can so the things that are much more important to me than work, which are my family members, always, always have time for me um, in the end. Again. <clears throat> you're going to have people coming to you and asking you to take on projects, join committees. You know, you always, <clears throat> pardon me, you always hear the people who say, you know your problem, you just don't know how to say no. You're going to be able to know how to say no, and you're going to be able to have the confidence that you're saying it for the right reasons. When I ask you to do something and you say, wait a second, let me look ahead at my calendar and see what my time is like. You're going to know that you've got deadlines marked, You've got the work time it'll take to meet those deadlines marked. You've got your own personal development time marked. 
and those openings that you see, then you can decide if you have enough of those to give away to accept this new challenge or opportunity or vacation, whatever it is coming along. And the bottom line is, with effective time management, you're going to be a lot better able to handle those inevitable problems that come along. The quote at the bottom is um, on a longtime um, co-worker of mine. We were reference librarians together. And this was what he claimed was the mantra of every manager. When in danger or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. That's certainly the opposite of what most of us hope to be remembered for. And I think the effectiveness of time management can help with that. We don't know what's happening in libraries. I don't know about you and wherever you are, but nothing has stayed the same in Ohio libraries for five, six, seven years. I think prior to that, they said we've changed at the speed of a glacier. But since then, not so much. With this kind of confidence that you can build by taking back your days, you're going to be ready for whatever the next day will bring. You're going to be happier. You're going to enjoy your work more. Your library is going to become a more functional and better place if you can put even some of these tips and ideas and others that you can read or find on the internet to use. So at this point, Janet, that's the end of my presentation. And if I would be happy to answer any other questions that have come in. OK, we do have a few more questions. Um, let me just get a little bit organized here. Um, we have someone who manages multiple libraries. And she's at each one two to three days in a row. Uh, and she's looking for ideas for portable organization. Um, she needs to be able to access everything at both campuses. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, again, I use Microsoft Outlook, uh, Microsoft Office products, including Microsoft Outlook. And I have an iPad now that I can access it on. You know, I used to carry around a laptop back when they told us that laptops were light, and then, but they're not. <laughs> so that's the best thing I can think of. I mean, I can get into folders, I can get into Word, I can get into my email and anything like that, and I can carry that with me anywhere I go. I can also do it on a smartphone, but with my bifocals, I prefer the iPad. So I guess in your case, it would probably be better to have something in the you know electronic arena as opposed to kind of an old-fashioned day timer, especially because it will allow you to get back and forth to documents and things as well. So that, that would probably be my suggestion. You know, iPads aren't that expensive now. If you buy the not the newest version, the one before. I think you can get it for about $200. So again, if your library will buy it for you, that's great. But if not, it might be one of those investments that you want to make in yourself so that you can access this kind of programming. And if you don't have um, a Microsoft product purchased by your library, my second suggestion would be Google. Because Google's got just about everything um, that that the commercial, more expensive products have in terms of calendars and mail and files and everything. So that would be my second choice. OK. Um, another question on um, one, of, one of our listeners is a manager who has staff. She has some staff members. And she's also having um, patrons that she's trying to answer questions for. So she's helping with staff questions and patron questions. And she's just wondering how to deal with the interruptions. Well, that's an age-old librarian problem, of course. Um, and you know, the best there's there's not a solution to that because you're never going to stop them. But the best management, I think, of inter of interruptions that I've been trained on is the ability to um, be working with one or two people, and when that third person comes up, to just say, you know what, let me just get you started, and I'll come back as soon as I can. Because that, that maybe that brief amount of time that you can give to get somebody started or to begin to give somebody an answer is often enough just to satisfy them. And they know you'll come back when you can. You don't say when, but when you can. And then you can get back to the other things that you're trying to do. It's a constant juggling act because you're always going to have those additional people coming in. And again, I would suggest if there's any possibility at all that you can get like a one hour for office hours off the floor where you can deal with staff issues and separate them from time that you're spending dealing with customers. That would probably be a benefit. But again, you can't make those interruptions go away. The best you can hope to do is manage them. And I think getting people, getting everybody sort of rolling on their own and then just going back as you can to add whatever they're waiting for you to do 
can be one way to manage that. Um, that's, a, that's a challenge, though. Okay, um, we have another one, um, someone who is, is new in their job and they're finding that their supervisor is not great at time management and it's making the transition even more difficult. Any thoughts on how she could handle that? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one again and that picture of the woman surrounded by junk, I think I've worked for her several years ago. I've worked for people like that too. I, you know, I think the best um, way to deal with that is by communication. Maybe if you could ask the supervisor if it would be okay if you guys could have a weekly meeting, maybe even just a half an hour. Tell them that you feel, again, I think whenever anybody makes a suggestion to a boss about anything, it should be centered on this is a solution that can help the library. I have an idea for a solution that can help the library. There's no boss in the world who's not going to want to listen to something that's going to help their library. And if there is, then shame on them. So I might go to the supervisor and say, it would be really helpful for me, and it would help me to be more productive and more successful here, if you and I could have just maybe a 30-minute meeting, just once a week, maybe Monday morning or whatever day, and at that meeting, make really good use of it by doing that prioritizing I talked about, you know, bringing in the things that, a list of things that in your mind, you need to be focusing on that week and what you need in order to be successful from your boss. So you're just looking at sort of one week at a time rather than all those, you know, weeks and months kind of floating by. So that would be my suggestion. You know, make sure that you word it in such a way that it's a way that they would help you be more productive and successful and then just do that reprioritizing every week. Okay, that's a great suggestion, Catherine. Um, one last question and then I know we didn't get to all the questions but we'll, we'll get those wrapped up and get those responses back out to everyone. But um, this last question is just kind of elaborating on, you mentioned that you read email only at the end of the day. Um, and they were just questioning not at the beginning of the day or in, at midday. Uh, that's correct. It, sometimes, you know, if I, have it, if I have something really important going on that I know I'm waiting for something, I might check it just be go, before I go have my lunch or something. But I, I have to tell you, I try really, really hard to read it once a day. And I'll tell you what, I, I applied for a job many years ago, and I was communicating with the person who was doing the hiring. And I was really getting frustrated because she wouldn't answer my emails until like 5 o'clock. And all of a sudden, somebody said to me, oh, she checks her email in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, I was at peace <laughs> because I knew what time she would check. She had been dependable so that I trusted that she would respond to me. And it was like, okay, I can get on with my life. I know I'm going to hear back from her. It, it really kind of set up a very, very functional and, and very trustworthy relationship. And so that's what I've sort of tried to mimic. And of course there are times when, you know, like I said, something special is going on, I have to go off. But for the most part, I, I really, really, really try hard to keep that focus because I don't know about you, I had just about given my whole life over. My husband and I have even agreed to turn the ringers off on our smartphones because we sit there at night watching TV and we hear that little bloop. And we reach for our phone to see what the email is. Like, does that matter at 9 o'clock at night? No, it doesn't. So I just try as much as I can. And you know I what? If you, one more thing. If you, if you can't do it cold turkey, then set up like maybe three times a day that you check it. And that's all. You know, kind of, kind of um, get off it like a smoker, you know. <laughs> and then after a few weeks, maybe two times a day. And see how, see how close you can get to a once a day check. I think that's a great suggestion, Kathy. I know myself, I'm definitely guilty of, of doing some of um, what you're saying, and I, I think your analogy to the mail truck is, is just perfect um, as far as that's concerned. Um, okay, I think if, if that's all, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. Um, did you have any other comments, Kathy, before we wrap up? No, I think I'm done, and I appreciate everybody's attention, and um, that's all. I'll be happy to answer the questions online later, Janet, if you want to send them to me. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you, Kathy. 
Um, we appreciate Kathy's insight today and sharing some of these tips on how we can all make better use of our time that we have available to us. Um, there's some great discussion and we appreciate you all sharing your time with us. We hope that you're able to take away a few tips that will allow you to be more productive in your day. You will be receiving an email following this presentation in a couple of days, and that email will include a link to this webcast. So if you missed something or you just wanted to review, um, you can go back and refresh yourself on some of these topics, or you can share it with your colleagues. Um, we will also get any of those unanswered questions documented and get those all out to you. Um, in addition, you'll be receiving a survey to let us know how we did today. Um, please take a few moments to fill that out if you can. We are just getting started on this webinar, on these webinar events, and we just love your feedback so that we can make these sessions even better in the future. Um, feel free to comment on any other topics that you'd like more information on or speakers that you'd like to hear from so that we can consider building some of those into our schedule in the future. Again, thank you for, for joining us today. We do have some additional webinars coming up. Kimball and Cullen will be presenting Zoning in on Children's Spaces on October 17th, and that one has an emphasis on planning children's spaces. And we will have Tom Linfield from the Madison Community Foundation on November 29th. And he will be discussing how communities can work together to improve the collections and programming for the libraries in their area. You can go to the DEMCO website to register for those. And we hope that you will consider joining us for one or more of these events. So additional webinars will be announced as the schedule is developed. And for now, um, I just say have a great afternoon. And we'll see you later.